Systems work, people fail. Welcome to InsureMark's Advisor Mentorship Podcast with Vice President Jeremy Hauser, where we share proven systems and processes for the 21st century advisor. Today, it's essential that advisors find a way to differentiate themselves from the competition. Learn how to elevate your game and accomplish incredible feats as Jeremy teaches you how to build a more successful and sustainable business while realizing a better work-life balance is not only possible, but achievable. Welcome to this week's episode of the Advisor Mentorship Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Hauser. And this week, we have a special episode with a special guest who happens to be one of the most successful entrepreneurs I have met in my life and continues to successfully not only build businesses, but also sells businesses. So love for my audience to introduce to you guys and girls, my uh, co-host, Steve Kearns, founder of InsureMark. Good afternoon, Steve. How's it going? Uh, good afternoon, Jeremy. It is going great. Thank you for having me. That is great. So, Steve, if um, what I actually love about your story, especially in Shermark, working for in Shermark here for the last 10 years, is a lot of people might not know your story of how you created in Shermark almost 40 years ago. So, what exactly brought you to Houston, Texas, and how did in Shermark come about? Oh, wow. Are you sure you and your audience want to hear this story? Well, <laughs> it is a unique, it's a unique story. So I moved to Houston, Texas in the spring of 1978 at a time when in Houston, everything you touched turned to gold. And <laughs> uh, it was one of the first boom eras of, of the city of Houston. And how I got here was I was the managing general partner. Uh, there was a three-man group, and we bought the franchise rights to a very successful chain of submarine sandwich shops back in the Midwest uh, throughout Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, the Dakotas, kind of a regional submarine sandwich uh, situation up there. It was very successful. Mm -hmm. And it was that time in my life, it was time for me to uh, leave home and home uh, it was Omaha, Nebraska, and it was time for me to, to take off and, and, um, and do my own thing. And I had a friend down here in Houston uh, who was actually one of my partners in this venture. And, um, and I grew up in the snow and the ice and the cold weather of Nebraska, and I was ready to really move away from that and go to some place where it was warm most all of the time. And so um, threw everything in my car and drove 990 miles south of where I grew up and landed in Houston, Texas. And, um, and we opened up uh, Memorial Day weekend of 1978. We opened up the very first Little King sandwich shop here in Houston, Texas. So that was the name of y'all's... Uh Y'all's company or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's called it's called Little King Sandwiches. And like I said, back in the late 70s and through the 70s, and as I was in middle school, junior high, high school, frequented them. Uh, so it was it was very successful and popular in my region of the Midwest. And uh, so we bought the franchise rights, the five county that at that time. Houston was basically in five counties, greater Houston. It's now in eight, I believe, seven or eight. Uh, but we bought the franchise rights. And it, uh, the, uh, it, was a, it was a learning experience. We opened, our, we opened uh, for business Memorial Day weekend of 1978, and we were out of business by Thanksgiving. <laughs> and oh, uh, so, yeah, so there, and there were, there were a lot of reasons for that. One, I was 24 years old and I had never started uh, a business before. I had, ne let alone being a managing general partner. We, we had very poor support from our mother company. Uh, we, they, they, had, they had not done any long distance franchising. It was all pretty much regional. And so they didn't understand the, the Houston uh, market. And quite candidly, Houstonians in 1978 weren't ready to eat New York style submarine sandwiches. There were only three sandwich shops in the city of Houston in 1978. They were called Blimpies 
uh, at that time. And so we, we were competing with barbecue and hamburgers and Chinese food and all of that stuff. And, and it just, it did not go over uh, in the summer of, of 1978. So, uh, and as history would prove, we were about three years ahead of our time. And in 1981, Subway came to Houston and opened like 50 or 60 sub shops, uh, all within a period of two or three years. And, and then Schlotzky's and, and Jimmy John's and Quiznos and Jersey Mike's. And it, it, you know, over the last 43, 44 years, everybody in Houston eats sub sandwiches. So we were just so you, a little, little bit ahead of our time. So you seem to follow the sandwich industry, uh, the what ifs, do you still track it or just come about? Uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm still a critic of submarine sandwiches and, uh, <laughs> and I have my favorites and, and, uh, but it's, it, yeah, I, I, I do follow it and it's, it's actually having its challenges as well. Uh, there's not many, one of the fallbacks of sub sandwiches is you don't have the drive through aspect that you have with your burger, your burgers and, and, and sometimes chicken and things of that nature. But, uh, it's mostly a kind of a walk-in deal. I would say another thing that another, one, one of the things that we didn't get support and what, what, what we didn't know about here in Houston was we, we did not get a liquor license. Even at lunchtime, Houstonians like to have a beer uh, or alcohol at lunchtime. And that really, hmm. believe it or not, that really hurt us as well. So a lot of learning lessons. I had every dime I had in the world went into that. I was 24 years old. I lost $80,000. So it was a, it was in retrospect, it was a, it was a great $80,000 investment in a business education. I probably couldn't have got in college and, and it, it helped prepare me for what I have built, uh, since 19, uh, 1983. And, and so from possibly looking at baloney for the rest of your life to now <laughs> financial services. So in the last, so as an entrepreneur, what do you find? to be some of the most rewarding parts of owning a business? For me, what I love about owning a business and what my joy has been since 1983 is the journey of building a business. To me, I, I was, I was a, an, an athlete and I loved uh, the realm of competition. And to me, building a business, I, 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 set it up as I was competing against myself, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to be victorious. I wanted to win. And, uh, so what I have, what I've have loved in my lifetime in building in Shermark was just for me, the real joy was in building the business. And, and that, and that is all the challenges that, that I faced. And boy, let me tell you, I've, I've made so many more bad mistakes than I have in good mistakes, but they've been, they've been good, bad mistakes. If you know what I mean, where I've been able mm -hmm. to learn, learn from them. And so I've been very fortunate in, in, uh, in doing that. And, and also it's just, it is another thing and that, and the way that, and, and, and what your listeners need to know is that my, partner in starting this business was my wife, Becky, and she is still to this day. And when we started in Shermark, which wasn't started as that name, it was actually started as first Houston insurance brokerage mm -hmm. in December of 1978. Um, it was our commitment to build a business based on relationships. And it was for us, uh, we wanted to have a business where we could serve people and we could, we could help make other people's lives better. And whether that was the employees that were brought into our life or whether that, that was the, the uh, financial advisor or the insurance agent at that time, right. uh, be, before people were called financial advisors uh, that needed our help uh, with product or a better business practices or, or, or what have you. So, so it was always our focus to make other people's lives better. And, and that was very motivational for us. We had a lot of challenges. I mean, we, we started on a shoestring. I was, I, I went from 
selling bologna and smelling like bologna and smelling like onions and smelling like fresh bread and tomatoes and all, all that <laughs> stuff to uh, I had to make a living and I just got married to Becky and, and I, uh, I came down to Houston to start a business. I went back to, to marry her in September, took her away from where she'd been her whole life and nine, 900 to a thousand miles away. And, and then two or three months later, the business folded and here we were, we were 900 miles away from home. We had a failed business. What in the world? We're 24 and 22 years old. What in the world are we going to do? And so I got in, I got into the life insurance business. And so I sold life insurance uh, from 1978 to 1983 to when I, when I started Insuremark or first Houston insurance brokerage and actually sold life insurance for four years after we started Insuremark from 83 to 87, because um, it was very difficult. There wasn't really much of insurance distribution back in 1983, like there is today. Mm -hmm. And so we, again, I was learning a brand new industry. I saw a niche for it. And so I had to learn that. It took five years for the first five years, literally every year we thought we were going to go out of business. I'm one of those classic stories of we maxed out all of our credit cards. Um, I was not savvy enough to know how to do SBA loans, how to get mezzanine financing, how to go out and and raise uh, proper funds to do capital funding for for my little business. I just kind of did it the old the old fashioned way. And our, my, my dad, who was a great mentor of mine, just said, you know what, give it five years. And if, if you don't make it, then, you know, you dust yourself off and you, you still live in a great country where you can start another business. And, and, uh, and, then, and then you learn from that. And right around the fifth year, deep, deeply in debt, all of a sudden we turned the corner and that was about 1988. And, uh, and there's a lot of, lot of stories that go with 1987 and 1988, why that why that happened, but then we, then we took off. I love to tell the story that in our very first year, we were, that we were in business at First Houston Insurance Brokerage, our our gross revenue in the first year was thirty eight thousand dollars, and that's what we made. That was the entire year we made thirty eight thousand dollars. So, what, what would that be equivalent to today's dollars? Do you think? Oh wow, uh, I don't. You mean yeah, probably. I mean, with inflation and everything. Yeah. What do you think? Probably, probably a half a million dollars, four to $500,000, something like that. So okay, I was just planting seeds and, and I was, <laughs> I was literally working. I spent the daytime building an insurance distribution business from breakfast to dinner. And then at night, uh, from dinner time to 10 o'clock at night, literally almost every night I sold life insurance. I worked the family market I worked every night. I worked Saturday mornings and I had to do that from 83 to 87 to pay our bills. And uh, so it was, um, it was a challenge, but we succeeded. So for, for the challenge though, um, so you, you talked about a couple of things, but if you could pinpoint one for, let's just say for InsureMark for the last 38 years, what would probably be the most challenging thing that you've had to go through with our company and being the leader? change. There has been innumerable changes in the insurance distribution business, literally. Uh, and early on, it might, be, it might be one or two or three things that changed every year. And then it got to be maybe one every quarter and then one every month. There is, there is change weekly now. We live in a we live in a totally different world in 2022 uh, than we did in 1983, 1988, 1993. It is totally different. Our customer is different. It's not just an insurance agent anymore. We we are dealing with financial advisor financial advisors and registered reps and registered investment advisors and financial ind independent financial advisors and. And we have a high degree of, of, of regulation and compliance and almost more onerous uh, underwriting, uh, not only medical yeah. underwriting, but financial underwriting that we, never, that we never had before. So it is, 
uh, it's a real challenge when it has been a real challenge and the, and the changes are not going to stop They're They are just coming rapid pace uh, every week, every month, every quarter. And you just, you've just got to get a rhythm and, and on how to, how to deal with them. So that would be, that would be one of the, one of the biggest challenges. Um, and also I, and I I also might say in that is, uh, that is dealing with relationships are, uh, are a little bit different. Again, as I said, Becky and I, we, we started and built our business based on relationships. We feel that is key. Uh, we want to make a difference in people's lives. We want to make, we, we want to make certain that the, the advisor that does business with us, that we've, that we've brought value to him, that we've made a difference in his life. Hopefully we've increased his, his, uh, his finances his, and he's doing better financially, which in turn will hopefully make his life better. And maybe who knows his, his marriage better, his family life better and mm-hmm. all those kind of things. And people have changed in the last 38 or 39 years and relationships are a little, honestly, are a little bit harder than they were um, because civilization has changed. <laughs> pe- 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 people have changed. Technology has changed people. And, um, uh, and one might say, is it good or bad? I'm not, you know, I have, I have my opinion about that, but uh, there's a lot of great things with technology, but I think technology has taken a lot of the human connection out of, out of relationships. And, and that's what I started this business on. And that's what I still believe in, 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 in what we do, no matter how, 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 financially, uh, how, how technical we become, how proficient we become technically, it still is all about relationships. It's all about Jeremy, when you, when, when the people you do business with, when they realize Mm -hmm. that you truly care for them and you care and you, and you sincerely care and want to make their life better and you make that effort and they see that effort, then that is a very satisfying and almost very joyful thing to experience in one's heart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's what, that's what has always motivated me is, is to hopefully make a difference in people's lives. Well, we, we saw last year too, we saw two years ago and a lot of advisors, um, some of them, unfortunately might not even be doing business today as they were two, three years ago, just not being able to adjust on the fly or have, the right resources to propel, to propel their business to actually do things with technology. Not right. saying you you can't operate without it. Um, you, we've seen advisors succeed without it, but it's a little challenging over the last two years. So knowing over the last two years with everything that's been going on, a lot of companies similar sizes in Suremark, unfortunately, just didn't make it. So right. thousands of businesses have actually gone under, but yet. And Shermar continues to grow. I think over the last two years, we never really necessarily took a step backwards. We profitably continue to grow. So in your opinion, what, what is that or what's that? What's helping Insuremark succeed and grow when other companies our size seem to not be moving forward the same way? We've been able to uh, adapt by, by working outside, looking outside the box, working outside the box. I think mm-hmm. one of the, I'm not very good at a lot of things, but one, one of the things that I'm good at is I have the ability to look around the corner to have a strategic vision down, down the road to see what is coming. And I've been really, really fortunate to have a very high success track record on seeing what is coming. And so therefore we've prepared for it. We've adapted to it and so, so we, that's one reason I think that we've been, we've been very successful. We've been one of the things, um, and I'll go back to my background. My mom and dad were, were raised as farm kids in Nebraska. So it's a, it's a unique culture. It's a culture of you get up before sunrise and you work after sunset. And you, mm-hmm. It's the whole golden rule. You treat people the way you want to be treated. You save most all of your money. You don't spend all of your money but you, you treat people the, the right way. And uh, so that kind of meshed over into, I, I've kind of become what my, what my parents have, what my parents have raised me. But, but I think one, one of the things that we've, that we've been successful in 
And that is we have, we've, we have adapted, uh, we have, we've adapted to change. And I would say that one of the, one of the differences between a good financial advisor and Mm -hmm. a great financial advisor or a top producing financial advisor is that a, that a great top producing financial advisor is willing to listen to somebody who might be offering change to them. Okay. After, especially if that change has been vetted for them, which we right. do for all of our, all of our financial advisors, we've done all the hard work. We've done all the vetting. We have found out whether the, whether ABC works or XYZ doesn't work or whatever. And, mm-hmm. and, and so that, that then leads to a, a human element of that individual and that's the element of humility and that's and that is is being humble enough to go what uh i've been doing okay for the last 10 15 20 30 40 years and i don't want to change so i i'm happy with what i'm doing and i th- i've been okay i'm paying the bills and that's okay but mm-hmm. it, you and i both know this we can make them greater than that and we have and we have and so those people that are humble enough to say okay tell me what you got. Show me how people are doing it. Show me, show me why it's successful. And if they're humble enough to, to get to that point and humble enough to, to do what we tell them is successful and to adapt and, and, or to adopt to what we have, then we've, we have, we've made a lot of good advisors, really, really more successful advisors. (laughs) Now, and, and to that point, I mean, 38 years of us, of well, you, uh, building up in Shermark, we seem to have, and what I hear from our friendly competitors and other advisors that continue in to recruit every every day, um, as we chat and have these conversations, it seems like our brand of Insuremark and just the the culture we have and certain things with the advisors, the relationships we build with them. There's that trust component and loyalty. So what what is that? Is there a is there a secret to our madness? It seems like, at least for me, when I chat with my friendly competitors at other groups, they always tend to tell me that Jeremy, I I bump into an insuremark guy, they just refuse to even talk to me. So I, and I I don't say that just to to boost us, but right. more so it's it's very rewarding to hear that. But also, yeah. is there a reason for it, or what? Why why do you see that over the last thirty eight years? First of all, that warms my heart to hear that. Uh, mm-hmm. to hear and, and I and I hear that from you and from your from your your colleagues here at Insuremark. I hear it from the carriers that I that I deal with all the time. And I hear it from our all, all of our competitors who are all good friends of mine. I you know it's like man, these insuremark guys are sticky. They are just uh, you know and we live in a we live in an environment we have we have stuck I we have stuck to our values. Mm-hmm. We have straight, we have stayed true to our, our, our vision and our, and our mission. We have stayed true to, to valuing the relationship with the advisor, putting him first and foremost above every, everything else. And, and because of that, and when, and when we start and then build a relationship, there's a high degree of trust. We have never yeah, and I don't want to sound holier than thou or self-righteous, right. so please forget. But we have never cheated an agent. We've never stolen from an agent. We've never lied to an agent. And we live that they're just there. There is that side in the industry. One of the things that 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 I I was raised. If you're gonna if you're gonna have a business and start a business besides making a difference in people's lives and taking care of the people that you've been entrusted to help, help grow your business. Uh, the most important thing is, is to make a profit and, and you need to make a profit because if you don't make a profit, you can't stay in business in the long haul. And I think we've been profitable for almost 39 years. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that is we, we have our objectives. We have our profit objectives. We, we, we in our budget, we we share what we can share with our advisors, how we support our advisors, how we pay our advisors, how all the all the things we give them better than anybody, mm-hmm. how many value addeds we have, that our value proposition is candidly overwhelming 
for the advisor, all the different things that we can do to make a difference in an advisor's life. It's honestly, sometimes it's just, I've told you this, I've told your colleagues this, it's almost too much. It's, it's like it's like an advisor can come to InsureMark and walk down the cafeteria line with his tray and go, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good. And mm. and and we have it and you know that. So yep. any anyway, so I think I think profitability, I think, I think successful people or people who want to be successful want to do business with successful people. And we have proven our success over 38, almost 39 years. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and our carriers know us very well. The carriers know all the people who maybe aren't totally truthful, totally honest, totally above board. And they know we are. And so a lot, I, I know for a fact that our carrier partners sing our praises all over the place. And uh, so I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I look back and I go, man, I, I, there have been opportunities where maybe I could have done something under the table, or I could have skirted this, this ethical issue or skirted that, skirted that ethical issue. And again, I'm not, I don't want to be holier than thou or self-righteous, but it's just in my makeup to not do that. I just, that's something that Steve Kearns doesn't do. So yeah. And, and I think to your point, uh, we've also in the last couple of years with being around for so long and developing those relationships, I think, especially through, I'd say the last two years, especially we've actually grown substantially, but also we've attracted some of the newer advisors you're mentioning. A lot of these RA advisors and other ones who tend to have some uh, really successful practices already in play. And they just look at us as a a good partner. So what's, what's your thought process or how do you go through a decision-making process within Shermark on what resources to offer new advisors? Cause as we continue to evolve and we have our vetting process. So can you let the audience know a little bit about what does Steve and what does the company do to bring in new resources to stay relevant and continue to grow? Well, so one of the things is, is one of the things that I do is I vet, I vet all of the carriers that come to us and say, hey, listen, uh, we'd love for you to distribute our product or our products. Uh, we vet uh, all the value, the, all, the, all the value adds, all the different marketing programs and lead mm-hmm. and prospecting and, and best practice resources that we have. And it, for me, it's pretty easy. Number one, is it good for the advisor? Number two, is it good for the advisor's client? And number three, is it good for InsureMark and for the people at InsureMark? It's elementary, well, but yeah. but but that's always kind of been been my uh, my mantra to just follow to make certain that it's that old three legged stool. Does everybody does everybody win in that scenario? And we have the good fortune of being actually one of the oldest insurance distribution companies in the United States. Uh, How does that make you feel? I'm proud of it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of it. And because I've seen a lot of my competitors come and go uh, yeah. over, over the last 38 or 39 years, I've seen a lot of really talented and aggressive and forward thinking uh, competitors come after mm-hmm. me and are doing, doing extremely well actually do more, maybe do more, more premium and more revenue than we, than, than we do, but, but that fits their model. And, and, and we love what our model is. What I would, what I would call uh, is we are, we're a boutique, uh, we're Mm -hmm. a a boutique advisor development organization. And, uh, and we're not just a product provider and we're not just a, a revenue sharing organization with an advisor. We are an advisor development organization. It is our job to, yes, provide good product, to provide uh, a, a platinum level of products. One, one that I would, one of the things I would say that, that what we are, and I truly believe this, um, we are a product fiduciary at, at InsureMark. Uh, mm-hmm. We are not beholden to any carrier or any product at any time. And so that's why one of the reasons why I think 
our growing partnership with registered investment advisors uh, and independent broker dealers and, and, and registered reps. I think as we have started uh, doing business with them in, in, in the recent past, uh, why, why it's gone so well, because they, they can see we're, we're, not, we're not trying to cram one product or, or one mm-hmm. carrier down their throat. We are truly product fiduciaries. We really want what is in the best interest of that retail client of that advisor. And because of that, there's a, there's a trust level, a trust level that's built up with the advisor and then other RIAs tell other RIAs and other right. IBDs tell other IBDs and other registered reps tell other uh, tell other registered reps and so there it goes. So and, well, you've you've always so at the very beginning you actually said something and um, it, it's very true and I could say it to to you definitely. It's like uh, the saying with uh, Wayne Gretzky, what made him good, he always saw where the puck was going. So you seem to always have a a good eye on what's coming. So. For the audience, uh, someone like yourself with all the experience in the world, where do you see the industry going for 2022? So for fixed index annuities, what, what are, what's your overview coming up here for this year? And then also, uh, what are anything new at InsureMark that maybe advisors should be aware of for 2022? Sure. This will be self-serving, of course, but sure. I, I... Well, it's a self-serving I, podcast, right? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but but I want to be I want to be at the forefront of what's going on, and I think we are. Your your audience may or may not know the the things that we do. Uh, we distribute fixed index annuities. We are one of the very first organizations in the United States to distribute fixed in, fixed index annuities back in the late nineties. And I see there's going to be, I think we're, we're coming out of a, a, of a pandemic, even though we're in the middle of Omicron right now. Uh, we've had, we had at, at InsureMark, uh, we've had a great rebound. Our 2021 uh, numbers have, have been a great rebound from our 20 numbers. We have almost gotten back to our night where we were in 19. I'm really, really proud of that and proud of you and proud of your colleagues for doing that. So uh, our business is really, really, really healthy. Our life insurance business has, has just absolutely taken off. I would say to your audience and to anybody that hears this, I think one of the biggest areas that, that a that a wealth advisor or somebody who, who sells fixed index annuities or uses annuities uh, as an asset allocation or a part of their insurance planning. It, and I would say 85 to 90% of those, those advisors are really missing out on the value and the benefit of life insurance and mm-hmm. all the things that they can do with life insurance to, to enhance their ability as a wealth manager or as a, as an, in, uh, as an insurance advisor. And then, at, as, uh, and what we started doing a couple of years ago, uh, which I think is, is a, uh, just a massive opportunity and that's asset-based long-term care insurance. Uh, it is going to be drastically needed by the American retail public. And we have, sol- we have solutions. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that advisor out there needs to have that. But I think the biggest thing uh, and the thing I'm really excited about, and that is our brand new RIA that we have in partnership with our parent company, Simplicity, and that's the, our new Simplicity RIA. There is going to be a massive transfer of wealth from generation to generation in the trillions, 30 to $40 trillion. And there's going to be a lot of money moving. And a lot of that money is going to have to go into wealth management, account, uh, management accounts or managed accounts. And, and, not, and, and you're going to have to be a little bit more than just an insurance advisor uh, and selling annuities and selling life insurance and selling asset-based long-term care to capture those assets. And so it, 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 a few years back, uh, the snowball started, uh, as our industry started, as, as some folks started dealing with RIAs, developing their own RIAs, working in conjunction with RIAs. And, and so now we have, uh, our, our brand new RIA at Simplicity, uh, which I am unbelievably excited about. 
and, and the infrastructure that's been set up, the financial technology that we're going to have behind it, the people, the intellectual capital, it is going to be unbelievable. And I hope that, that, and I know you are and your colleagues here in Shermar are going to be telling all of your advisors uh, about how to capture more assets by, by using uh, the Simplicity RIA besides using the products that we already have. So long answer to your question. Uh, I'm really real. I'm excited about everything and everything that we do right now. I'm, we're, I think we're going to have great growth this year. Yeah. I, I anticipate that 2022 may, may be our best year ever, or it'll be mm-hmm. very close, close to tying our best year e- ever from a few years back. But the Simplicity RIA is just going to be, it's going to be a game changer for what we do here at InsureMark. Mm-hmm. I, I completely, completely agree that that's the biggest opportunity. And I do believe uh, 2022 is definitely going to be amongst just the momentum the advisors continue to bring from 2021 with the amount of marketing that we're doing, different things, getting in front of different customers, uh, expanding brands across multiple states, right. leveraging technology. I, I see it too. 2022 is definitely going to be a, a huge year for InsureMark. For, I know we're, we're wrapping up here. So is there anything that uh, maybe we didn't discuss or words of wisdom that you'd like to give the audience? Wow. I would just say uh, to all of your customers and all of your audience, just maybe something that, that, that my dad told me when I first started this thing 38 or 39 years ago. Uh, and it was, he said, Steve, when people sincerely see that you care more about them than you care about yourself and you care more about their well-being than you do about yourself, you will be successful in whatever endeavor that you do. And I took those words of wisdom from my father and put them into the creation of InsureMark. And I've never wavered from that. I've never wavered from, from those words of wisdom from my dad. And, uh, and I won't ever until, until my dying days. It, it's, it's who we are. It's who I am as an individual. It's who we are for this, Jeremy. It's who you are as a leader at InsureMark. And I will just say to you and to your audience and, and the people that work with you, they are very fortunate and very blessed to be able to work with you uh, as their advisor development consultant. You have, you have done an, an incredible thing in the 10 years that you've been here at InsureMark in growing and helping your team. And you've been an integral part to the growth of InsureMark over the last 10 years. And and, and you know how much I appreciate you and how much, how grateful all of us are in Shermark for, for what you've done. So, so to all of the, all of Jeremy's buddies out there that he works with, you guys have got a gem and don't mess with him or you'll have to answer to me. <laughs> Pre- appreciate you taking some time out and joining us today, Steve, uh, and to the listeners, thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the Advisor Mentorship Podcast. Click subscribe on your favorite listening device so you do not miss any future episodes. And until next time, we will talk then. Thank you for listening to the InsureMark Advisor Mentorship Podcast with Vice President Jeremy Hauser. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available and connect with Jeremy on LinkedIn to stay up to date. If you would like to request our introduction kit, feel free to check out www.advisormentorship.com and click on learn more. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InsureMark. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. Thank you for listening to the InsureMark, the advisor mentorship podcast with InsureMark Vice President, Jeremy Hauser.